Hello everybody, my name is Liz Darlison, I'm the Chief Executive of Mesothelioma UK and as you'll know um, we've been um, conducting a series of interviews with people of interest and trying to cover topics and subjects that we think are supportive for people who are living with mesothelioma um, and today I'm absolutely delighted that we are going to be talking to um, a local coroner, local to where I work and um, the reason for doing this is that um, you know, coroners play a very important role um, in mesothelioma and um, it, it's often something that isn't, um, it should be, but it often isn't discussed with patients and their families. And we would like to just demystify that a little bit and give people a little bit of insight into what that whole process might look like. So um, it's a great honour. To, um, oh, and I should also say that whilst we refer to uh, this process as a, a coroner's inquest in, in, in England, we have to remember that it's procurator fiscal um, it, for our um, friends in Scotland. So um, now forgive us if I'm going to be referring to notes. There's a lots of things we want to, to get through. So what we've, we've uh, both written a bit of a list, but it's a pleasure to introduce Mr. R Ivan Cartwright who is um, area coroner for Leicester City and South Leicester. So welcome, Ivan, and thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us today. Thank you. Nice to see you, Liz. Thank you. So I'm going to kick off with um, just a, a few questions about what, um, what's the training and the background for somebody who um, should become a coroner? Well, coroners are generally now lawyers. Uh, I say now because they used to be um, taken from the ranks of lawyers and doctors, uh, GPs, hospital consultants and the like. Um, the law, a, a lot's changed. I won't go into it in, in great detail because I'm sure it won't interest everyone. But a lot has changed in the last 10 years uh, since a, a new act, an, an act of parliament that came in in 2009 called the Coroners and Justice Act. Uh, and that came into force in England and Wales in July 2013. And that's really given the whole service uh, and the whole coroner system a shake-up. Uh, it has a shake-up every so often. It's been around since 1194. Uh, and don't worry, I'm not going to go through the whole history of the coroner. <laughs> um, but certainly the last great shake-up um, was in 2009, and that's led to major changes in 2013. I hope most of them good and most of them that have um, uniformed practice around the country and also um, led to some sort of updating in relation to procedures. So to answer your question, coroners now, or those who apply to be coroners now, and I've been a full-time coroner only since June 2020, and a part-time coroner before that, uh, have to be lawyers. So they have to be barristers, solicitors, or fellows of the Institute of um, Chartered Legal Executives. And they have to have five, at least five post-qualification experience. Um, and to be a little bit more helpful, most coroners who have been qu qualified as lawyers have often worked in areas that are sort of peripheral to what a coroner will look, look at when a coroner is a full-timer or a part-timer. That is in clinical work, uh, perhaps in clinical negligence work, in personal injury work, in industrial, uh, industrial sorts of accidents sort of cases. And also, um, less, less often, but in criminal work or work that's more forensic. Um, I, I say doctors aren't allowed to apply anymore, which, um, well, my own personal opinion is that that's unfortunate and a shame um, because clinicians are also very valuable on the coroner's service. And I'll come a little bit further when you ask me about my local area. Um, but since July 2013, those who are doctors but not lawyers uh, are not permitted to apply to become coroners. So that's generally the route. A uh, lawyer working in, a, in, a, in an associated area, then you apply and become a part-timer and then a full-timer. Part-timers are called, sorry, I was going to say part-timers are called assistant coroners and full-timers are either senior coroners at the head of an area or area coroners who are their deputies. And I guess, so that kind of describes who's in the, in the team at a coroner's office. I mean, there's more than that. And can you just tell me, you know, in a typical coroner's office, what kind of team members you would have? Sure, yes. Um, in Leicester, and Leicester is, is fairly typical, I would have thought, because the size of the team depends largely on the number of deaths that are recorded. And, and you, you probably know this, and those who are listening probably have some idea, 
um, that not all deaths are, are reported to the coroner, or, although there's a good proportion of those that die um, are, re are, are reported to the coroner. And then the coroner will, will look at uh, and scrutinize and examine the circumstances around those, those deaths. And some will go to inquest, but the majority will not. We'll come to that. Um, but in relation to the structure, uh, it's, a, it's a local authority recruited position. It's not a nationally recruited position. So the local authority manage the team effectively. They are local authority employees. Um, you would, in our area and generally, typically, you'd have a head of service so that would be a manager who would be the coroner's um, service manager or the coroner's and registration service manager. Sometimes the two areas are linked. And then you'd have, and, and these are the person, the key persons who have most contact with families, you'd have coroner's officers. And we have um, about seven coroner's officers. I say about because not all of them are full time. So about six and a half to seven full time equivalents. Um, they, are, they, they have constant, that is daily contact with families. And of course, with other stakeholders, with hospitals, with general practitioners, with the police, with the ambulance service, that, those kind of um, people. Um, and they assist by getting the information, collecting all the information together, which the coroner will look at over the course of weeks or months or even longer on a complex inquest. And then if an inquest is required. Um, uh, we, we also have administrative assistants sort of who help with the general logistics and administration. So that, that tends to be, I suppose, the structure from senior coroner down to administration. And um, we also have court or inquest officers. We have two in Leicester who help with the actual um, the court process, welcoming the families, assisting the families, ensuring that the families are comfortable, ensuring that witnesses are looked after, that kind of thing. So that's and, sort of the, the structure. And, and you, you touched a little bit there on the kind of role and responsibilities of the coroner's um, office. Can you just talk a little bit more about, I mean, what proportion of deaths are reported and, and what is the remit of the coroner's office? Well, the, coroner, the coroner's role, um, I suppose, in a nutshell, is to look at um, deaths which are reported. And deaths are reported for a number of reasons. And there are tw 12 or 14 key reasons, but deaths generally come the coroner's way or the coroner's office way because they are unnatural, because they, there is no cause of death which has been provided by a general practitioner or the hospital. Um, and for a number of other reasons, for instance, deaths in custody, those that happen in a custodial environment, in a prison, in a police cell, they're always referred to the coroner and they generally tend to be inquests. If I be more specific, and there are also deaths which must be reported, which are the result of accidents at work, for instance, where the health and safety executive get involved. But to even be even more specific, those deaths which may have been caused as a result of a consequence of industrial diseases, and there are a number of diseases, but of course, um, you deal with one very specific and serious one, um, but it, deaths which are a result of industrial diseases are always reported to the coroner. And I should point out at this sort of early stage, they are deaths that may have been um, as a result of an industrial disease. If there's any inference or any indication that that may be the case, then it's for the clinician, the police, the ambulance service, the GP to refer to the coroner. And then it's the coroner's decision or the coroner's duty to look at whether in fact on the balance of probabilities that the death is or has uh, been as, as a result of industrial disease. I mention that because the two things are slightly different. The clinician, or at first reporting, will look at may, uh, possible, and will look at probable, balance of probabilities. So we've covered why people um, with mesothelioma, when they die, why they need to be referred to the coroner, because it you know it's suspected that it's a, an industrial cause of their it death. It usually is, yeah. And we've covered who's responsible. So um, either GP, hospital doctor, you said paramedics as well, did you say? So yeah, Well, sometimes some deaths, uh, I mean, it wouldn't be usual, of course, because in a, for a mesothelioma death, there's normally a diagnosis for some months or, or perhaps years. There is no, there's normally, although I know every case is different, but there is usually a deterioration in health. There's usually been some specialist care uh, and then further, perhaps at a later time, palliative care. Um, so it wouldn't be usual, for yeah. instance, for a death 
just to be known about only because an ambulance um, turns up in order to assist the family or assist with um, the diagnosis of death. But I mentioned the, 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 um, our local East Midlands Ambulance Service because, of course, they're a very um, regular stakeholder. It's much more usual for a mesothelioma death. And sorry to preach to um, those who know more about it, Liz, than, than I do, of course, uh, um, with your 20 years in, in, in specialist service. Um, but it's usual to have had specialist care uh, via the hospital and the general practitioner. It's usual that there's been a diagnosis. OK, it might only be, unfortunately, a few months prior or it might be 18 months. I saw one um, recently, a death where there was a diagnosis about four or five years ago. Um, so usually there's a deterioration, sadly, in health. And then usually, therefore, um, there's a there's a knowledge from the family or next of kin that that uh, the person is is approaching death and there is palliative care. So usually the coroner's office will be aware via the general practitioner or the hospital. And usually it will be the coroner's office who will reach out and will contact the family rather than the other way around. So that was my next question. So in, a, in you know, what we hope is that somebody has had support and care at home and a very peaceful death at home and expected death and the GP has been called and the patient's death has been certified. That's the normal procedure at home. What yes. can a, what can a family member expect? So, who, what, where, and when will the coroner's office contact them? Or should they? Would it help if they contacted the coroner's office, for instance? What should be the first step? Well, I guess there's the two ways of, of answering that. Uh, there isn't any problem um, if family, if a family member, next of kin, or a family in consultation are, are worried, have have got stresses or concerns about what they do next, just simply don't know. Um, they can, of course, contact the coroner's office as soon as the officer is made aware. And best practice is that the officer will be made aware and will have a record and details of um, the person's passing really within 24 hours. Um, so, for instance, if there's a death over a weekend, um, we, the coroner's office in Leicester, should know about it on the Monday morning um, or you know, by the Monday morning. So as soon as somebody, uh, one of the coroner's officer logs on to look at the work that's come in over the weekend, so eight o'clock on Monday morning, or for instance, if it was next week, eight o'clock on Tuesday morning, the coroner's office sh officer should be aware. Um, so to answer your question, families, of course, can get in touch with the coroner's office. The officer will only be able to assist if they've had the information through, but the, any information that comes through basic details should be through quickly, ideally within 24 to 48 hours after the passing of the, of the deceased. Um, then, in, in certainly in our area, and I've looked back at the, um, sadly, the number of mesothelioma deaths that, that I've dealt with um, in the course of my time in Leicester since the 1st of June 2020, um, slightly less than 10, but of course still a, a significant number, um, the coroner's officer would usually, um, allowing a little bit of, of res allowing respect and consideration, of course, for the shock of the passing um, um, of the, of the, on behalf of the family, they will get in touch and offer advice and services and make the family aware that they, they're aware of the details and really keep them informed immediately about what the process is um, and what the inquest process involves. That's what so should happen. We'll come on to that, the, the inquest process. So I just want to, we've established that um, a patient who dies with mesothelioma, a person who dies with mesothelioma or suspected actually, so even if mesothelioma is suspected, um, um, should and uh, will be referred to the coroner and it's the responsibility of the medical team usually to make that referral and there's no need for the family to contact the coroners the coroners are notified within 24 hours of death usually taking into account usually. weekends and the coroner's office in due course very shortly after death will be in contact with the family yes that's, that's absolutely yes. right that, okay. that's best practice in every area <clears throat> but i know it happens in leicester OK, and so um, and, I, and I guess we should maybe just based on what you've just said, the the um, the reform that came in in 2013. I know at the time a lot of us were hopeful that there would be some standardization of this whole process and procedure at that time. And that didn't happen, I don't think. And there is some variation. Um, but can you just talk us through? what um so this is the leicestershire or your experience having worked in you know you've worked in two coroner's offices 
Um, yes. So what what is the normal kind of uh, standard process for an inquest following uh, the loss of a loved one with mesothelioma? Sure. I mean, there is there is national guidance now, fortunately, and <clears throat> um, national guidance is provided by the chief coroner's office. The chief coroner is a, uh, is an appointment that came in only after 2013. So it's for three years. So we're on our third chief coroner and the chief coroner provides guidance as to best practice as to how coroners should act in certain situations and in certain procedures and protocols. And that guidance is generally followed um, because it would be unwise not to follow it. And the uh, chief coroner has also, um, chief coroner's office has also provided guidance fairly, relatively recently in the last 15 months on post-mortem examinations. And I mention that because I imagine one of the concerns that certainly faces um, persons who are in touch with you and bereaved, uh, those who are bereaved, bereaved families, and perhaps those who are nearing the end of their life or it's expected they're nearing the end of their life. One of the concerns as far as my officers pick up is the expectation or worry that there would have to or must be a post-mortem examination um, on, on the deceased person to, in order to confirm the diagnosis. Now, that's certainly not my experience of working in two areas. What, what firstly, I should say is that the coroner's office, um, in all cases, takes on board the considerations and concerns and anxieties of the family and takes on board their wishes. Usually, um, usually there's been either, we've talked about this, usually been a diagnosis in life or where there hasn't been a formal or firm or recent diagnosis, there have been perhaps biopsies taken in life. Um, so the coroner's officer will look at that first, look at the diagnosis and report that to the coroner, ask a, a the pathologist whether there have been in-life biopsies in the recent period, and also then go on to gather information about occupation. Now I mention all that because they are all key, key that's all key information when a coroner comes to a listing or uh, organizing an inquest. Um, one of the other concerns that people have is that, well, an inquest, that's going to be a, a formal process. It's going to take a long time to get there and we're going to have to wait a long time for closure. Um, I, I can certainly say in Leicestershire and in Nottingham, but certainly in Leicester, um, we, we work on the basis that where there is a diagnosis, where there is an in-life biopsy, where there has been, for instance, a claim, um, so there's a, a solicitor involved or where there's been um, contact with mesothelioma UK and there's some documentation involved, we will look at that uh, and we'll obtain that and look at that. And when I say we, I mean the coroners, in order to, as best we can, uh, avoid the need for a post-mortem examination. Not just because in, in a lot of cases, it's not a particular um, process that the family want to or uh, go down if they, if they can avoid it, but also it, it adds delay. And certainly when I've looked at the mesothelioma inquest that we've dealt with in Leicester since I started, they have generally been completed in a matter of weeks rather than months or years. Uh, um, and I say, I don't say that as if there was any need or want to hurry the process along, but I do know that families would like to get through that process. Yeah, it's, as it's helped with as grieving. Possible. I think it, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a bit of closure on something and they can you know it can delay grieving i think if there are issues or left undone so so what in what circumstances would a post-mortem be required with somebody with mesothelioma? What, uh, I, yes if i go back and try and help with what i was talking about for for example if there is a if a clinician has said this may be as a result and that might be for a number of reasons but for let, let's let's give a, a common example um, a GP or a hospital clinician or doctor may say, well, this, but we're aware that this person was a coal miner, albeit they were a coal miner for only a few years in the 1950s or 60s or 70s, or this person worked um, with um, hazardous pro uh, processes, or this person was a heating engineer or an electrician, but they worked on sites in the 1960s or 70s or 80s, or unfortunately later than that sometimes, where there was exposure or there may have been exposure to asbestos. Um, and the clinician may say, so there's no diagnosis in life, but we do have this concern or we do have this information and it's for th therefore Mr. or Miss or Coroner, it is therefore for you to look at and to consider. 
that would be the sort of situation where we would return to the family and say, we don't have anything firm in terms of diagnosis. It might be useful and helpful in order um, to um, provide that, uh, provide that um, clarity to have a post-mortem examination. Now, in some cases, a family will say, yes, please, um, we'd like that clarity um, because we want to know how our loved one died or why our loved one died. Or in some cases, we'd like to have clarity so that we can consider our options in terms of you know, the terrible suffering our loved one went through in the months before his or her death. And it might be that families, and this has happened to me again in the last 11 months, families say, no, we are happy. We think there may have been exposure in the past. We, we don't have a diagnosis. We would like to um, deal with it as, 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 as quickly as possible. We're not envisaging a claim therefore proceed as you see fit. Now that would likely mean that there wouldn't be an inquest of course or there may not be an inquest or that inquest may not um, result in a conclusion of industrial disease because um, I don't want to jump ahead um, Liz unless you wish me to but of course the main point of an inquest is to get to a conclusion. And so how much does um, do, do your decisions um, of how much are your decisions influenced by whether or not the person who has died is pursuing a civil claim on, and then the family on their behalf? Well, after? well I guess the best, um, the best way of answering that is that, that it's not impacted at all. Good, um, yeah. So it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't matter to us. Um, it matters in that, of course, if there's information that we can utilise, because in, in many cases, where there's been a diagnosis of mesothelioma or, or there's a perception that death is as a result of mesothelioma, there will have been a claim or, or is a claim ongoing or maybe even just commenced. And uh, uh, before I was a coroner, I was a barrister. I worked in personal injury and I worked in personal injury, um, including industrial diseases. So I'm well, I'm well aware and my colleagues are well, colleague, the coroner colleagues are well aware that vital information could have already been collated got together by the solicitors for the claim. So you, in what, um, in perhaps one in three cases, I see, uh, I, I ask for, the coroner's officer asks for, contacts the solicitor and asks for a statement that may have been taken while the deceased was still alive, even if it was in the last weeks or, or even sometimes the last days. Um, so that, because that will give vital information about exposure um, to whatever hazardous substances, obviously normally asbestos, during the course of the life of the person's life, working life. Can the um, person? You... Sorry. Sorry, go on. No, go on. You sorry. You go on. No, I was going to say, but to answer your question, it doesn't impact in any way on the management of the inquest or the decision to go to inquest, because yeah. a coroner aren't allowed to be influenced by civil or criminal liability. You spoke about um, statements and evidence um, that you look at, you know, and, and information that you look at. Can family members or indeed, you know, um, the person themselves with mesothelioma before death, can people um, help prepare uh, and help the whole in inquest um, process? Yes, they can. I mean, it's really, really helpful if, um, for instance, uh, family members are aware or start to think about um, perhaps when their loved one and uh, before their loved one dies but when there's been a diagnosis or deterioration is occurring um, let's be frank it can sometimes be rapid deterioration or when palliative care has commenced and um, it's very useful for the family to think about and start to write down and get some information about occupational history that's really useful for the coroner's team because they will ask about that anyway. And, and often um, next of kin, often family members, sons, daughters, um, nieces, friends, ex -co work colleagues and the like can really assist with an occupational history. And it, it's absolutely invaluable because of course, after the event in the short time after the lo your, your loved one has passed, the last thing really you want to do is look back at work diaries or pay slips or anything like that because there's so much to do anyway. And, and it's, so, um, it's so draining emotionally. So it, it's really helpful for a person, either person nearing the end of their life or their loved ones to think about, <clears throat> think about occupation, 
excuse me, and to write anything down. I must to admit that, question, uh, sorry. that that's that's often the opening for me um, to to talk about the the the. Uh, referral to the coroner and the inquest often at the start of a patient's journey when we're thinking about you know benefits and compensation and um, we ask people to do a bit of an itinerary of their work history yeah. and um, yeah. it, you know often I will say it'd be really useful for you to keep a copy of that because I hope you don't think it's insensitive insensitive of me to say but whether or not mesothelioma is the cause of your demise um actually you it, your death would be referred to the coroner and it's really helpful for them if you keep a copy of that so you might want to start a little yeah. file and keep copies of any claim forms or statements or anything because it will help your family in their in their in their in the early stages of their grief when the coroner's office are asking for information if you've got that to hand it really helps so often it's been you know a way for me to broach the subject of the coroners when we talk about yeah. doing that work itinerary for other other reasons. Can I just ask you the actual inquest itself then? Um, so um, when you when you're wrapping up and you're making your final decisions, is that a face to face yeah. event? Is it is it done remotely? Do people need to attend? And how long after the death is that likely to happen? Right. I hope hopefully I can answer all of those questions conclusively. Things have changed a little, of course, since March 2020. Um, where remote attendance at inquest and non-attendance at inquest have become more usual. Um, I'm trying, I'm thinking of the inquests that I've done that have involved mesothelioma deaths since uh, June 2020. Um, in only one case have we had family members attending, and I should point out immediately that's because they wanted to attend um, to have to, you know, their part, that, that was their feeling about their part of the closure. So that was facilitated um, and it should always be facilitated because families should always be, uh, it should be possible for them to attend. But I mentioned that the fact that in other cases, pe uh, families didn't because um, it isn't necessary usually for family members to attend or to give it, uh, evidence or anything like that. It is usually um, a decision uh, that can be made on the papers, what we call a documentary inquest, sometimes called a read uh, inquest. So if we have the information that we've been talking about that we require, and if that information is going to assist us make a decision on the balance of probabilities, then the coroner can produce what's called the record of inquest. That's the formal document that goes forward to the family in order to register the, de the death. The detail that is provided upon that can normally be uh, can normally be uh, clarified and obtained without any attendance at inquest. Um, I say that sort of <laughs> for two reasons, uh, I suppose in two ways, because families are always welcome, uh, especially if they want to, and I can well understand why they may want to, but there's certainly nev never a situation, or very, very rarely would it be a situation where the family would have to attend, and if they did, want to attend, it's very, very unusual for families to need to give evidence because there are already signed statements, there are already, uh, there are already hospital referrals, a diagnosis, that kind of thing. And does the news of an inquest, um, might it make the local paper? I mean, is it like other kind of proceedings, legal proceedings, that it can be considered public property or if you know what I mean? Well, the, the hearings are public. And um, coroners, uh, for, for only in some exceptions, coroners can say, no, you can't come into this hearing, member of the press or whatever. Um, I won't bore you with, with, with uh, those exceptions and those reasons. Um, but uh, to, an to answer your question, certainly in the last 15 months, there's been very little press interest in, in almost all inquests. Uh, and that's probably because it's been more difficult to get to court and there hasn't been anything as much evidence aired. Um, I guess the answer, short answer is uh, in, the result of an inquest can be as private or as widely available uh, as the, the family wish, uh, largely. Um, a, a documentary inquest, a, a red inquest, is of very little interest to the press. Um, so uh, if, if privacy is, re is required or wanted, although the coroner cannot ban uh, press members from wanting to attend, it's very unusual for the press to be there 
for documentary inquest days or documentary inquest sessions um, because there isn't, you know, the, uh, forgive me, but there isn't that kind of um, sensationalism yes. of the person giving sworn evidence. And is, is, what proportion are, of, of um, inquests for mesothelioma are documentary across the country, do you know? And we, we accept there's a variation, and um, but have you, have you any idea or is it uh, by... I, well, I think I'd say nationally, it, it would be something in the region of two thirds to three quarters. Right, so in that's our encouraging. Area, in Nottingham, I would have thought it's higher than that. I would have thought it's 75 to 85 percent. Right. Um, so I, I'm speaking very generally, and I don't mean to because this is a very individual um, point for for obviously anyone listening or to, or, or hearing this. Um, but sort of nine or ten since um, last June, as I've said, uh, they were all documentary inquests. Um, so the the information was not in dispute. It wasn't controversial, and there was a it was a there was a perceived and expected conclusion of industrial disease, which was communicated to the family in advance in any event, as in the coroner's officer was able to inform the family, this is the likely conclusion, uh, yeah. because this is what the coroner has already looked at, and unless and until further information comes to light by the coroner in the next couple of weeks before inquest this is likely to be what the coroner um, will find and the coroner will conclude and of course industrial disease is its own conclusion there are a number of what we call short form conclusions like road traffic collision that kind of thing and industrial disease is its own short form conclusion um, so i would have hoped that any family who attend a documentary or, or other inquest um, would be well aware not only of exactly what was going to happen and who, what information was going to be available because they will have already been provided with that, but they will also be aware of what the likely conclusion will be. And I guess um, this wasn't on the script at all, but I just, um, as uh, somebody working at the hospital and um, dealing with patients going through their um, diagnosis and investigations, is there anything we can do clinically to support um, the process? So I was thinking, you know, sometimes they will comment when they're looking at scans that there is evidence of pleural plaques and but that doesn't always make the final report um, or they'll say, um, you know, look, this person's got a bit of fibrosis. It could be asbestos related. And and I just wondered, yes. are there things that clinically we could do that would make things easier um, for the process? Well, as far as my experience in, in, in our area, in Leicester City and South Leicestershire is concerned, um, I think the short answer, I'm afraid, is no because um, you already do and clinicians already do everything. For instance, where there is a concern uh, or, or an indication that there may have been occupational history uh, around exposure and therefore there may be, but not formally diagnosed mesothelioma, um, chest x-rays, uh, biopsies will generally, and notes about th those procedures will generally be offered um, and they're offered at an early stage. And if, for example, the coroner requires more information, more formal information, the coroner's officer on the coroner's request will ask for a report or a statement from that clinician to sort of put everything together. Uh, and that clinician will likely look at the relevant notes anyway. So that might explain, or that might, uh, in, in that sort of case, there might be a, a, a slight delay. But again, it's usually in the period of weeks rather than months. When I look back at the uh, mesothelioma documentary inquest, that I've completed uh, in the last 11 months at Leicester, they've generally all been done within 28 days and sometimes within 14 or 21 days um, after the person's passing. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking to do them within a couple of months. Certainly, you know, I, I've always found the coroner's um, office team members that I have dealt with over the many years I've worked with mesothelioma to be very compassionate, caring, and very well aware of, um, you know, the, how sensitive we need to be. Um, so, I, you know, I, I've never had an issue, but I have heard, you know, that isn't the case across the whole of the country. And what I'm hoping is that since that 2013 and we've had the, you know, the lead coroner and all the rest of it, I, I think there has been change. And I think there is more, um, there's, there's less variation um, yeah, than I, there I, used I, to be. I would hope so. I mean, uh, it, it shouldn't really need to be a direction 
for coroners and for coroner staff that families need to be and are at the center of the process you know that should be obvious <laughs> because they are you know bereaved people it's a very very difficult time um, and especially this terrible disease which um you know still um kills a, a lot of people per year more than it really should have done if they'd stopped using um, hazardous substances when they should have done um although i won't get into that because that's a whole other subject on that's its own it certainly yeah. i mean the other thing i just wanted to mention just to reassure people is that although the inquest may take two three four weeks um that doesn't mean to say um that people can't in the same way that they would even without an inquest they can still engage with a funeral directors they can still well, start to plan yeah. about um yeah. you know the, the 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 final farewell and the celebration the service yes. and um it doesn't delay the funeral by that length of time. Um, no. Often, the, you know, you release the person um, so that the funeral can take place. And sometimes it, there is no delay, actually. Often the delay is waiting for, you know, a slot at the cre crematorium or, yes. um, you know, yeah. something else. So it doesn't necessarily mean there'll be a delay. And if it is, my experience, it's maybe only a day or so. It's nothing, you know, and you can still make all the plans that you would do normally. Yes, I, perhaps I should have said that an earlier no, time. No, no, that's OK. Oh, um, release we, we in Leicester I, I think mo most areas but certainly best practice is to look to release um, the re release the, the deceased person to their loved ones to the family as soon as ever possible and really to try and break down the obstacles that prevents that from happening so um, I, I talk about three or four weeks and that, that I think that is a good time period Very no good. we certainly wouldn't need um, to retain <laughs> The, you know the deceased for that time they should be released as soon as we have any as soon as we have certainty certainty on the balance of probabilities of the cause of death um and then all the other the other investigations the collation of material the collecting together of reports that can happen while you know the, the funeral or, or, or has has already occurred um so we don't need to you know physically retain um the deceased person unless of course there is a post-mortem examination and in even then we will look to release as soon as that process has happened and in Leicester we're again we're quite blessed because there's a very full uh, and experienced pathological team um, and we try and deal with post-mortems you know as soon as we ever can really. Again my experience is it's you know a day two days um, if it's a weekend that can or a bank holiday that can yes. you know cause Sometimes problems but generally speaking um, it doesn't necessarily delay things. It can often be, like I say, waiting for uh, slots at the crema crematorium and so on. That's been incredibly helpful. Um, I just wondered, and again, I didn't ask you this before, but if people do have any further questions or concerns, are there any uh, websites? I mean, they can always, people can always call me Zithilema UK, and if we don't know the answer, then we will, you know, make contact and, and find, find the answer. But are there any uh, useful websites or um, I mean, obviously, people can always phone their local coroner's office if they've got uh, questions. But yes. outside of that, is there any websites or um, information well, uh, services? Every, every coroner's area, every local authority, and within should be within that. There should be a separate coroner's um, website. Um, our website is being revamped at the moment, and I know uh, it's it's available, of course, because there are dates, for instance, of when inquests are happening. And um, but uh, but just because it's being revamped, uh, there, there is still a, a website available. And there will be questions, uh, there will be FAQs, frequently asked questions about the deal particularly with this area. So um, it's helpful to have sort of bite-sized little pieces of information about the process and about what specifically to do. Um, more helpfully, or I hope more helpfully, if anybody has got a particular question and they think, oh, well, I haven't thought about that. What do I do about that? And I don't know what to do about that. The coroner's officer, and there will be an assigned coroner's officer, hopefully from really 24 hours after the passing of the loved one, right until the inquest is completed. The coroner's officer will always try and assist by phone call, by email, um, uh, to answer any questions that are, that are outstanding. So if I was um, in the unhappy position, of course, um, of having uh, being in the same family as, as a newly bereaved from mesothelioma, I, I would phone simply phone email first or phone one of our officers and say, look, can you please can you give me a call? I've got some questions. I don't even I don't even know really how to ask them. Please could you give me a call? And and that will that will never be unheeded. 
that's certainly my experience. The coroner's officers have always been the first port of call and I've always found them to be incredibly supportive and helpful. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan. That's, as I say, it's been incredibly helpful. And, um, you know, I, I hope we've given people some insight into the process um, and demystified it a little bit and um, hopefully made them feel reassured um, that it's, um, it is a process, but they'll be very well supported through it and people are gonna be very sensitive um, with every step uh, along the way. So thank you very much. No, no problem, Th lovely talking to you. Thanks, Liz. So I'll stop recording.